Good afternoon, everybody. I am uh, David Cash. I'm the Dean of the John W. McCormick Graduate School of Policy and Global Studies. It's a pleasure to have everyone here and especially to have Representative Nika Elugardu, uh, who we will uh, hear more from and uh, get an introduction from, from our Associate Dean, Kiki Adozi, as she takes over as Master of Ceremonies. I just wanted to give a very quick welcome and introduction. This is a, a part of our programming of the McCormick Racial Equity Task Force, a task force that was launched uh, at the McCormick Graduate School in September. Um, partly something that we had been thinking about for a long time, but clearly pushed by the events of last spring and summer with the murder of George Floyd and the ensuing reckoning yet again, and maybe in a time that will have more staying power of racial inequity, <clears throat> violence, police violence in communities of color and a whole host of interrelated problems. And, and um, I'm really excited to have Representative Elgardo here today who has thought a lot about police reform, about defunding the police. And I will, uh, just to give a very quick point of how, how um, red flag the term defund is, uh, I, uh, as many people have done during the summer, we had Zoom meetings with my entire family almost every Sunday. And that the generations go from, you know, an, a se se seven year old to my mother who's 85 year old. And the discussion about defunding police brought tears and anger and recrimination and bonding. It was, and we're all essentially progressives. So it was a very interesting, the kind of power of what was happening at that moment um, is, uh, is very evident. And I am delighted that we have our public servant and our representative um, uh, who has been so thoughtful about how do we turn complicated things into policy that makes a difference in people's lives. Wonderful to have you here. So let me turn it over to Associate Dean Adozi. She has been a remarkable leader on campus in addressing this and many other issues, uh, but she has uh, been a stalwart um, uh, initiator of the McCormick uh, Racial Equity Task Force. Associate Dean Adozi. Thank you. Thank you so much, David. And um, I, I uh, as David has uh, suggested, I'm a number of things, but I'm also really a proud uh, co-chair of um, McCormick's recently launched um, Racial Equity Task Force, uh, which is um, called uh, MRET, short-lived. Um, but we were really, you know, so pleased to, um, you know, launch our committee in the wake of um, the George Floyd um, murder last year. Um, we're a forum um, for raising awareness around uh, race relations and creating spaces for difficult dialogues around uh, race relations. Uh, we are so pleased and excited to host um, our first speaker um, in a representative um, Elugado on this uh, second day of um, Black History Month um, and to facilitate um, what will be an important conversation. Um, I am here with um, my uh, colleagues um, uh, at Rem Emret um, and they are uh, Darren Q, um, a professor in um, one of our departments at McCormick, um, Esther Rogers, um, a former student, uh, public policy student and current psychology student uh, at UMass Boston and uh, Jarling Ho, who is both student and staff member in one of our uh, centers and institutes, uh, um, Jarling Ho. Um, so thank you for all of you. Um, uh, the title of today's uh, talk, uh, Racial Justice and Defend Defunding the Police uh, in Massachusetts Planning for Post uh, stands for Peace Officers Standards for Training Bill. Um, you know, that's, um, you know, on my mind, uh, you know, as, as David speaks about, um, you know, the language behind defunding the police, uh, and, and that's true, you know, there's been a lot of uh, debates around whether or not we should be using that language. Um, I, I don't really care, quite frankly. Um, what I think we should focus on is uh, the policies, uh, you know, behind uh, defunding the police. And I just want to remind us that HR uh, 7120, uh, which is the um, um, House resolution uh, bill on the floor, that's the George Floyd Justice in Policing Act 
of 2020 um, is a bill that um, addresses a wide range of policies and issues regarding policing practices and law enforcement accountability. Um, just some of the things that I know uh, the representative is going to talk about today um, include um, um, lowers um, in the criminal intent standard uh, from willful to uh, knowing or reckless, uh, limits on qualified immunity as a defense to liability, um, authorizes um, in the Department of Justice to issue subpoenas um, in investigations for police departments for their patterns and practices of discrimination. Um, uh, we want to understand the prohibition of ra uh, racial um, profiling, um, the banning of chokeholds, uh, the banning of no-knock warrants. Uh, we want to understand law that compels law enforcement training on implicit bias and racial profiling. And we want to understand um, uh, laws that enforce police officers to wear body cameras. So I think that um, the conversation that Representative Elugado is going to have with us today is going to touch upon the application of uh, these policies um, in Massachusetts and in uh, Boston and Greater Boston. Let me um, you know, introduce Representative Elugado. Um, you all know that she is um, our um, MA State Representative of um, the 15th Suffolk Norfolk District, um, which includes um, neighborhoods of Brookline, uh, Jamaica Plain, uh, Mission Hill, and Rosendale. Um, Nika's, as she's fondly called, uh, her work experience, training as a lawyer, and a policy leader, um, progressive values, and passion for our district uh, positions her to be a bold, effective leader on Beacon Hill. Uh, she won election in 2018, but she has over 20 years of experience in community and economic development with public, private, and nonprofit leaders in communities of color, uh, including serving as Jamaica Plain Liaison and Senior Policy Advisor to Massachusetts Senator Sonia Chang Diaz. Her broad experience positions her to be a strong advocate for our district, which she is. Um, Nika's professional career, helping nonprofit and business leaders work together to break injustice and open doors uh, to opportunity began at the National Consumer Law Center in Boston. She later became founding director of Mass Saves, an economic justice collaborative jointly sponsored by community organizations, financial institutions, and then treasurer Stephen Grossman. So much more um, about um, Nika. I just, just have to say she's a proud um, BS alum from uh, MIT in urban planning, MPP from Harvard's Kennedy School of Government with concentrations in political advocacy, um, leadership and peace and security. And she's got a JD from um, Boston University's law school uh, with externships in tax law, human rights, and corporate social responsibility. Just two, barely three in 2021 years in office, she has worked on a number of bills. I just want to uh, name a few of them. Um, S2 um, is um, her bill on um, climate policy. Um, she's got a bill on um, making appropriations for uh, the fiscal year of 2020 uh, for the maintenance of departments, boards, commissions, institutions. Um, she's got this act for um, organizing a head impact, uh, lead impacts uh, to school children. Um, she's got a gun safety uh, bill um, and she's got a next generation youth roadmap um, you know, bill on uh, climate policy. Um, so today, um, Nika is going to discuss her important work on police reform and racial justice. Um, she will talk about the implications of the defunding language um, and give us her take. She has been working with uh, the Massachusetts Black and Latino Caucus and others 
uh, for dismantling structural racism in the Commonwealth uh, criminal justice system. And she wants to invite uh, further insights um, in her talk today. Please join me in welcoming uh, State Representative uh, Nika Elugado. Thank you, Dean Adosier. Uh, I, I do need to clarify one thing that you gave me credit for all kinds of bills that I did co-sponsor, <laughs> but I'm not the primary filer on. So I have filed a number of bills, but I would be remiss in not uh, pointing out that uh, many of those wonderful bills are filed by my colleagues and I have been a proud uh, co-sponsor uh, of, of what those uh, champions are doing on our behalf and, mm -hmm. and worked with them on those things. Um, but you know, everything we do on Beacon Hill is uh, shared work and shared credit. And that's kind of um, gonna be a theme running through my comments today, not just shared with each other as legislators and staff uh, or others working inside the building or even advocates who come in the building when it's not COVID and there's a building to come into, uh, but uh, shared with our constituents, with our residents, uh, even with those who feel or even are disempowered or disenfranchised by those same laws. Uh, I do feel that it's my responsibility as a representative of every single uh, person in my district who's visiting, living, got there one day ago, uh, has been there for three generations, whatever, to make sure that I'm bringing their power and voice to the state house. And I know that uh, that my colleagues, uh, we, we, my, my colleagues share that with me. And that's what makes democracy so messy. Uh, was, as we look at the context, before I dive into the details of posts, and I really wanna focus on the strategy for how we got that bill passed and, and, and what needs yet to be done and, and how do we think about that going forward, not to answer those questions, but to lay out some frameworks for thinking about it and discussing it today. And uh, as the Dean said, I do look forward to uh, having a lot of feedback and, and, and having my own uh, views and experience challenged in the conversation. So uh, where are we now uh, requires looking a little bit at the context. Uh, you know, uh, last Memorial Day when George Floyd was murdered uh, for many black people, uh, that was not a surprise event that suddenly awakened us to the realities of structural racism. <laughs> uh, but it, it, as it turns out, I think for many of my white colleagues, it was. And, and I believe that because a lot of people called me and said, I didn't realize, I didn't understand, and in tears, men and women uh, calling to express not only their condolences, but their desire to do something about it. Uh, when I got elected uh, for the first time at the end of 2018, I casually made some comments on a radio program about the Democratic uh, Party being structurally racist. And I didn't think that was um, news. Like, it, I, I'm, I haven't been in politics, right? Like, as mentioned, I've been in the nonprofit world. I did spend one year uh, working in a senator's office uh, 10 years ago, but most of my stuff has been done here and in other parts of the world uh, on the ground with the community. So I thought everybody knew that the Democratic Party was racist and that all the parties are racist, <laughs> right along with most American institutions. Uh, I uh, came in with a lot more fanfare than I was expecting for other reasons too, but especially because of those in related statements. I, I referred to um, the infrastructure of, of the state house as a, a based on an old plantation model that many American institutions haven't, haven't let go of. And uh, I knew that was a little more, you know, a, a, a little less obvious to, to folks, or there might be some disagreement. But I didn't think that there would be the kind of a sort of uproar, how could you say that type of thing. And now here we are, after um, the, 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 the essentially martyrdom almost of, of George Floyd and so many other Black uh, men and women and children also, uh, here we are, like, it seems like people are racing to be the first one to dismantle structural racism. So I got to admit, at first that made me angry, like, where y'all been? <laughs> but I, you know, I had to do my work like many of us did, and not just Black people, other people of color, LGBTQ people, many people who have been fighting uh, to come away uh, from marginalization to the center of the decision making for decades or centuries. A lot of us had to do that work to say, okay, yeah, it's infuriating, but okay, now we have more of us. So let's do, let's do this work together. And honestly, uh, that is a lot of what happened with uh, getting that policing bill passed. 
I'm just gonna change this view. Hold on, I can't, I can't stand looking at myself. Somebody made that happen. <laughs> so I like to see the faces of the people. Um, oh, speaking of faces, when my face blew up, I have, I'm recovering from an injury. So forgive the glasses, I need those uh, for my recovery. And I've got weird things going on with my teeth. Hopefully that's not distracting. Uh, so we were uh, coming out of the George Floyd incident just one day after he was killed as state and local legislators of color. And I regularly meet with a group that is Boston electeds of color. That includes our county officials like uh, DA Rachel Rollins and uh, Felix Arroyo, the Register of Deeds, our city councilors who are of color, uh, Black, Asian, Arab, uh, Latin, and uh, it includes the state officials like myself. And so it's a group, I think we're now about 20, we're growing bit by bit. Uh, and it's only those who represent some part of Boston. So we all got together and we said, you know what? We need to, we need to have a coordinated response, not just among us, but we gotta talk to electeds of color across the state. And so we did what we could in 24, 48 hours to do that and engage the Massachusetts Black and Latino Caucus, which is the state senators and representatives. I'm a, I'm a part of that caucus. And then our city colleagues reached out to uh, local municipal officials of color across the state. And we came up with a 10 point plan. And uh, if I remember, I will drop a link to the Black and Latino Caucus website where that 10 point plan, you can still view that. I'm only gonna speak to the state elements of that plan today. So there were four federal from our Congresswoman Ayanna Presley, who was our only elected of color at the federal level. Uh, and then there were four from the state, and which I will discuss. And then there were two at the municipal level, okay? And at the state level, we uh, got together, just the, the state officials of color, the, the, the Black and Latino Caucus, and we looked at our, uh, our, what we maybe would call our dismantling structural racism agenda. So we started pulling all the stuff we're working on, which bills have that focus. And there are about 20, 25 bills. And we said on this list, what is the low hanging fruit where we can use this momentum? We're getting calls from the speaker of the house, the Senate president, the AG, uh, what can we do? So what is our answer going to be for them at the state level? And so we all submitted some top three ideas and we came up with four uh, pieces of legislation that we thought, so this is beginning of June, that we thought we could get through the building by July 31st, building on the momentum of these heroes who have died, uh, not by choice, but uh, by the grace of God, I'd say uh, their deaths are not wasted because uh, the world has mobilized around them. And those things were, those four things were post, which you've heard peace officer, which I like that better than police officer. That's how we say it in the legislation, not just here, but other, other places. Peace officer standards and training. That means police have to be certified and decertified as they are uh, in uh, the vast majority of other states. Uh, Massachusetts was one of, uh, you know, four or five states that still didn't do that. And, and when they're decertified, they can't get hired again, right? And that's for abuse of power or misconduct. And there's a whole process that needed to be set up. And uh, Rep. Russell Holmes had been working with that, uh, working on that for about uh, eight years. And in the last couple of years, the governor had agreed to really push it. So that's why it was low hanging fruit. And they were gonna do a commission, but because of everything going on, we thought, let's not do a commission. We don't need to study it, let's just do it. So we had the governor's support, the speaker's support, the, the Senate president's support. Uh, so that made it low hanging fruit. We can get that done in two months. And then we had use of force. So that's a big body, which our uh, rep Liz Miranda was working on a big bill. We knew some elements of that are gonna be very low hanging fruit because everybody witnessed this chokehold, right? And we all were probably part of many moments of silence to, uh, uh, to commemorate the suffering, not only of George Floyd, but of black people in America, uh, in, in metaphorically, uh, as well as literally. 
So we knew we were going to be able to get rid of that chokehold as low hanging fruit, but maybe some other uh, use of force things. And then the civil service exam, a lot of people know, but many don't know that you have to take a civil service exam and do all kinds of things in public service, uh, including become a police officer. And the way that's set up, it, it, it structurally actually disproportionately makes it harder for people of color to get in like many exams, <laughs> many standardized exams, but there's other reasons for that. And uh, one, of the, one of the groups we protect in that, that exam is veterans from all over the country. And we wanna protect our veterans and make sure they get access to jobs, but we wanna make sure that local people and people of color also get those access so that you don't always have a veteran from uh, Alabama come and displace, you know, somebody who wants a job in Dorchester, you know, as a police officer. And so uh, balancing those, uh, um, those needs, we thought, well, that's a little harder because anytime you're looking at something that people see as a zero sum game, meaning some people I think wrongly think we can't help both veterans and people of color, <laughs> uh, then that's gonna be more of a debate. But we thought, we think we could get it done under the circumstances. And finally, a committee on structural racism. Uh, that's something I have been working on uh, that I had inherited uh, with some work I'm doing with incarcerated activists at the department uh, and the Department of Corrections administration. And actually the original, original language for the first uh, structural racism commission came from incarcerated activists. They drafted that. It went through many, many changes before we put it forward. But uh, we decided those four things. And those are the four things to understand in terms of like, that's what we were trying to win. Now, before I go and talk about how that got blown up, and did not get done by July 31st, but thank God it did get done uh, before the end of the session that got extended right up until a few hours before session two. So we passed our last bills at about 4.30 in the morning on January 6th uh, and ended our, ended our last session and began our next session around noon or 1 p.m. that same day. So like many of you, it's been nonstop all that time in between, between COVID, and uh, various unrest. But there's more going on in our context, right? Because uh, we've got our uh, Black Lives Matter movement that was already going on. And so many people poured into that movement after George, George Floyd died. And we've got the pro-police response, right? Not just Blue Lives Matter, but lots of everyday uh, suburban folks who are just like, almost automatically against Black Lives Matter uh, because they see it as being anti-police, even though it isn't uh, inherently that. And then we've got this false politicization. Did I say that right? Politicization, politicization. You know what I'm trying to say. Uh, we make it political. We make it about left and right. So the leftists like myself, I'm a leftist, uh, but the leftists, are talking about defund the police. What does that mean? Well, there's no established definition. So I don't use those words as an elected official because I also represent police and ask them to do stuff that costs money. <laughs> uh, stuff that would actually get defunded first. <laughs> we defunded the police before the stuff I don't like. Uh, however, I'm very supportive of the defunding movement on the left, not only because I'm on the left, but because they are expressing the pain of a people for generations. And those words are important for communicating the severity and the extremity of what we are up against. And so I celebrate what they do, even as I don't use the language, because I also celebrate the hard work that our police officers do, and not only to keep our communities safe, but in my district, police officers provide self-defense training for free to women, anybody who needs it. Police officers helped me set up youth uh, meetings and uh, with, with young people who have been committing crime so that we could set them on alternative pathways. Police officers work overtime so that the single moms can attend the meetings where we wanna talk about planning for how we're gonna respond to some of the shootings that are going on in the neighborhood. Those are police officers. And also police officers are sitting around in, um, not anymore, I've complained about this. I actually haven't seen it in about six months, so I'm glad about that. But they sit around on the corner where there's negative action going on and they sit in the car and can't be bothered to get out and do anything. You could defund the heck out of that. 
as far as I'm concerned, but please don't, that's not what's gonna get defunded. What's gonna get defunded if you just take the money away is all the stuff that, that they consider to be extra that they've been doing in our community. So no, I don't say defund the, 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 the um, police myself and I don't promote that as a, just like a straight uh, unfettered policy, but I do promote it as a movement idea and we have to understand the difference. Uh, a, a political movement is not the same as legislation. And we need both. They don't work against each other. Unlike what you hear on the federal level, oh, we can't say these strong words because I just, I totally disagree with that. America's not ready for a revolution. Who's ready for a revolution, right? If you were ready for a revolution, then it wouldn't be a revolution. It would be a transition to the next thing we've got planned. <laughs> and so, so we don't need to be ready. We need to be able to somehow uh, embrace the people that are coming at this from different angles. As a representative, uh, I represent the Commonwealth as well as my district. And all these people are in it. And uh, we need the police to be held accountable for the ones that are beating us up. And we also need the law to be held accountable because many of the abuses that like it, sometimes we're in meetings where we list a lot of the names, we say the names, you know, Breonna Taylor, we say the names of the children too. If you go and look at those cases, they were legally dismissed and not because of qualified immunity in most cases, because it is considered reasonable for a police officer of any race to be afraid of our black boys and men and to use force when they feel fear for their lives, even if that force was not necessary because they were mistaken. So that's a constitutional problem because the right that that is protecting is a constitutional right. Our right against unreasonable search and seizure. But how has the state constitutional jurisprudence and the federal jurisprudence interpreted reasonable over the decades and the centuries. Disproportionately negatively impacting black people, immigrants, it's also ableist. People with disabilities get criminalized under that same, uh, the, the variety of doctrines that come out of that. And the list goes on, transgender people. And, and when you start intersecting these identities, it's worse for the people who uh, have intersecting identities, those named and unnamed. And, um, this is something that we can't just academically know. We have to understand how it applies in our legislation. So we got all of those four things. Uh, we got the post bill. And uh, if I have time later, I'll read a few of the details from you if we get a question on that, because I want to be mindful of allowing for the discussion. And I want to talk just briefly about how did it all blow up then, by like going back to post. How did it all blow up? Why did it take so long? Well, this false politicization, the word I still haven't figured out today how to say, I used to know how to say it. I blame it on my concussion. <laughs> uh, but it's not just federal, is it? And it's not just political people. It's that polarization is something that we buy into by choice at every level of government, including civil society, regular residents who don't consider themselves to be part of the democracy, but are. And what happened was uh, the Black and Latino Caucus was negotiating with the four police unions. And we negotiated a deal to get all four of those things, post use of force, civil service review uh, commission and a structural racism commission and some other things. And uh, while we were doing that negotiation, the Senate came out with a bill. And that bill had a bunch of stuff in it that was not part of the negotiation. Is that bad or good? That is not an answer I have for you today. But as a matter of fact, literally speaking, it did blow things up. <laughs> uh, it blew things up and made them take longer and it probably also got us more stuff in the end. And some of the stuff it got was good and some of it was a lot of pain because the police, I think, I think felt betrayed initially. But the Black and Latino Caucus at that time 
It was almost all house members. And so maybe there were things that we could have done between the house and the Senate, I don't know. But in any case, that bill came out and the bill we were negotiating was now in a way moot because the way that it works procedurally is that the House takes that Senate bill after it gets passed and that's the bill that we are now working with. So trying to reconcile that with what we have been planning took a long time. And it made me and many other people angry that it took so long. But I honestly don't know how they would have done it faster given the levels of breaches of trust that were there. And the difference between a political movement and moving legislation is the level of trust that is required to come across the aisle. Because we got the bill passed through the House and the Senate, uh, versions of the bill before July 31st, but it took us six months to reconcile those differences, right? Not because they were so wildly different as much as the trust was not there. That's my opinion. Again, it, it was said in the beginning by others and by me, this is Nika's take on it, okay? So people had to rebuild that trust. We had to remind police officers and their families, nowhere in this bill, including the Senate version, is anybody trying to take your house away? That was like one of the interpretations of the Senate bill. Nowhere in this bill is anybody trying to make it uh, hard for police officers to get due process. And then on the community side, we had to say nowhere in this bill are we trying to shut down the voice of the community on all these other issues on our list of 25 that I mentioned. This bill is our launch pad to the other 15, 20 things that didn't make it in. And we had to build the trust for people to believe that. And as we did that, we were able to get that bill out. Now, a, a good example that's very concrete that I've heard you mention, so maybe people are familiar, is qualified immunity. So there are some provisions in the bill that got passed and the governor vetoed some things and there was a whole process and we had to do it again. Uh, but the final bill came out and it has some limitations on qualified immunity, which is a, a doctrine that enables a court to throw out a case uh, in Massachusetts on, on um, use of on abusive use of force, abuse of force, and other things, but mainly abuse of force, if the uh, officer was doing a kind of a behavior that had never been tested in the courts before, and so it could be argued that they didn't know that it was uh, illegal. And an example of that is uh, in Massachusetts is using a taser for the, the first time a taser was used, uh, and uh, there was an argument that it was used inappropriately, but the training hadn't covered that. So that officer was able to dismiss that case on qualified immunity, but, but now they wouldn't be able to afterwards because now it's, it's been established as um, you can't use a taser in the way that it was used there. However, in Massachusetts, the last time a qualified immunity case was thrown out that I'm aware of, a case was thrown out based on qualified immunity was I think 2001. And um, uh, it's a real problem. There's a lot of abuse of qualified immunity on the federal level, but the first circuit, our federal court uh, here in our federal district here in Massachusetts, uh, we haven't been using qualified immunity as much. And actually nationally, it only represents about 3% of the dismissals is the data that I've read. And so it doesn't even begin to touch some of the other stuff that, that we've mentioned already. And so the Black and Latino Caucus House members did not prioritize qualified immunity for our short term plans. Because it hasn't been directly affecting people in the way that some of the other stuff was or just isn't as low hanging fruit because it scares police officers because they don't know what it is. They think it's uh, indemnification, which is like how you get insured if you get sued. Uh, they're not even they're not related. But just because, because people thought they were related and they got politicized, uh, they uh, got very upset even bringing it up. And so all that had to be negotiated. Did that negotiation have anything much to do with what happens on the ground tomorrow? No. But frankly, neither does post civil service review structural racism. 
These are infrastructure pieces. And so I'll close by saying that democracy is extremely inconvenient because uh, the stuff you really need to change to dismantle structural racism isn't the sexy stuff that gets the social media play. It's not the slogans. It's not QI, defund the police, blue lives matter, blah, blah, blah. And I feel like I can say blah, blah, now, blah, because I established earlier that I'm a strong supporter of all of those things <laughs> in various forms. Um, but all of that isn't inside the building. Inside the building is building trust to understand the geeky details on what actually happens when you change those words on the paper. That is some super boring stuff that people like me find exciting and maybe the people on this call. Uh, but it's inconvenient when you have to also balance that with how the world is see experiencing life. You know, people are being beat up by police in Massachusetts and they're like, so do something people, right? <laughs> And that's a very important critical inconvenience. We have to let things get blown up and try our best not to demonize each other so that we have these type of January 6th type of things, you know, where things have gone so far that now uh, the violence in people's hearts has fully expressed itself uh, on the floor of <laughs> literally the floor of the chamber in the Capitol building. And so really, we need to think about personally and systemically how we can almost good cop, bad cop within ourselves and celebrate all these different variety uh, that are coming in to make our democracy rich, difficult, inconvenient, challenging, but then get down to the brass tacks and figure out what we're going to change and how we're going to launch it into the future. Wow. Thank you so much. Nico, thank you. That was wonderful, um, excellent. Um, excellent lessons for um, our policy community here on the intersections uh, between race um, policy and politics and political process and procedure and why that's so important. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, just a quick question that um, I had as you were um, relaying to us you know, that story uh, that happened between June um, 2020 and January 2021 is, um, you know, I'm, I'm reminded of uh, the ACLU, um, I think she was the executive director, Carol Rose, who um, dismissed your bill um, and said it, would, it didn't go far enough um, and that it didn't sort of embody the, um, you know, pain of structural racism. And I wondered how you felt knowing that you were a champion <laughs> um, of um, advocating for uh, structural racism, you know, um, earlier, I remember your comments on the uh, Democratic Party. So just wondering how, you know, um, did you not go um, left enough? I mean, how did you feel about um, an ACAU um, criticizing your bill as not embodying uh, the spirit of um, George Floyd? not going far enough. Uh, really grateful for those kinds of comments because it doesn't go far enough. Uh, we have on the House side, 160 people. Um, a, a, a lot of people don't realize in Massachusetts, one of the bluest states, 30, it was between 30 and 35% uh, of our voters voted for Donald Trump in 2020 <laughs> after we saw him in full force. And what that means is we have a lot of districts that are purple in that 160. And besides Donald Trump voters, we have a great number of moderate uh, Democrats. And there's xenophobia and uh, racism that happen uh, all across the spectrum, including on the left, which is an interesting topic of conversation that needs mm -hmm. to be had. In this area, that happens on the right, yes, and moderates too. But there's also another set of experiences that moderates and conservatives have that need to be validated and wrapped into our understanding of what we're doing as we move forward. If you don't believe that, then you don't believe in democracy, as far as I'm concerned. I don't like the fact that I have to uh, uh, attach myself to viewpoints that I think are a double S backwards, uh, but I do because I believe in democracy. 
I don't have to do that to xenophobia. I don't have to do that to racism, but I do have to try and figure out, okay, what in your experience is not that? What are you trying to tell me about the ways that uh, you've experienced the police? That actually, if my community was experiencing the police like that, we wouldn't be having these protests, right? So we need to listen and hear. We're not trying to abolish everything. With some people, I'm about abolishing prisons. I don't believe in abolishing the police. I don't believe in that. But we, I do believe in abolishing prisons, by the way. But uh, that's a separate conversation. Mm -hmm. But we uh, need to be reminded by everybody whose interests are not being served by the bill, that it hasn't gone far enough. And the interests of Black people who are being killed and brutalized by some police officers, some bad apples, everybody likes to definitely come down on the bad apples, but I'm not a bad apple person. That's why I'm a prison abolitionist. <laughs> yes, it applies to police officers too, uh-oh. <laughs> uh, it is a structural problem. It's a cultural problem and we're all perpetuating it and the police are no different. So there's a lot more to do. Do I agree with every member of the ACLU locally on what needs to be done next? No, we've had many debates about that internally, uh, but it, there's nothing they think needs to be done that I don't agree needs to be done. And so I would never wanna say, how could you say that? Is it perhaps insensitive and not valuing the hard work we did to convince those conservatives uh, and to get that over the finish line despite a Republican governor who could just veto the crap out of that? So we need 107 votes in the House, not just 81. Uh, maybe, but you know, I didn't sign up to, for the job because I'm sensitive. So uh, it, no, nobody's obligated to make me feel good about the work that I do, except I do see some of my constituents. Hi, Dottie and Kathy. Uh, so I, I do hope that some people uh, do tell me when I do a good job. But I also need people to say when we haven't gone far enough because I agree, but also because I need to know. Thank you, Rev. Okay, I've got a, a you know, um, 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 panelists, um, a group of panelists who have lots of questions. I'm going to start with uh, Professor Q, uh, Darren Q. Um, take the first question, please. Okay, thank you, Kiki and um, Representative Avogadro. Thank you so much for joining us. And uh, you know, if you're getting if you're getting uh, criticized for not going too for, for going too far and not going far enough on both sides, um, you know, I think that's just a courageous mm -hmm. position to be in. So, um, thank you for the the work you're doing for all of us. Um, my question is uh, about um, engagement of the police. I'm curious if if you could tell us a little bit more. You talked about the bridge building and the trust building you did. Um, uh, what sort of um, consultation did you do with the police in terms of development of, of the bill and, and what were some of the feedback you were getting from them? And then second, I'm just curious, um, you know, uh, there are many different variations of, of police models uh, across Massachusetts. Um, you know, the Cambridge police, for instance, ha are very good about, uh, well, at least, in, I mean, in my opinion, they've got some interesting training models that they, that they do for their, for their officers and they, they do a lot in terms of community outreach I'm wondering if you know if there are sort of models across Massachusetts. Are you are you particularly influenced by, or you like certain things that some some towns are doing, and uh, that that perhaps inspired you in terms of thinking about you know what would be what what would what would be some of the models you would like to see um, uh, that uh, that police are doing in terms of the training that they're doing for their officers, and and you know more importantly, what what would you like to see, what sort of walk would you like to see them walking in, in the communities based on on what you've been learning? Thank you. Sure. Uh, so I have to be very clear and very and express my gratitude to the people who did those negotiations. Not me, first term uh, rep. That credit goes to the, the uh, previous chair of the Black and Latino Caucus. So now we have Rep. China Tyler. So we get it, our, our um, polity is that we switch up every year depending on seniority. Uh, and so uh, it was uh, Representative Carlos Gonzalez of Springfield, Representative Russell Holmes, who was a chair previously, who had worked on these issues, and us, our only at the time uh, state senator uh, Sonia Cheng Diaz. So those three led the negotiations and reported back to the Black and Latino Caucus, and they sort of led those on our behalf. And on all four points, post use of force, civil service, and structural racism, they were able to come to an agreement. Initially, it is my understanding, which obviously from what I've just said is uh, 
you know, I'm a lawyer, it's hearsay. Like I heard somebody say that this is what they said in there, but I think it's, it's well established that initially the police officers were really concerned that uh, because they put their lives on the line and they are very often interacting with people with weapons, legal and illegal weapons, that it could just be really challenging to put too many constraints that they have to be thinking of in the line of duty, you know, at that last minute. Uh, but one of the things that Representative Russell Holmes I've heard say publicly is that he said um, to them, because you are carrying a gun, that doesn't mean that you have less responsibility to be held accountable. It means that you have more. And my understanding is that people really got that argument uh, from the side of the, of the police. And they said, you know what, you're right. And they were very supportive of Post. Some of them felt like, gosh, it sure is hard to get rid of some of our bad apples. <laughs> and Post is going to help with that. Uh, and the civil service exam, if we really talk about it and make sure that we're protecting our veterans, we're willing to do that. And after George Floyd, there was even more uh, coming together around banning chokeholds and certain use of force. No knock warrants was harder to get. Uh, but uh, there were a lot that, uh, like, as long as you protect, as we did in the ultimate bill uh, against the, the um, need to do a no-knock warrant to preserve somebody's life, including the police officers. Uh, we were able to get uh, some uh, movement on that type of stuff as well. And then of course, as I mentioned earlier, everybody wants to dismantle structural racism now. So yeah, all the commissions we want, uh, but maybe like we care more who's on these commissions, who's on the training, who's on the post decertification. So a lot of what still needed to be negotiated was how many law enforcement people versus other kinds of professionals and community people are on the various committees and commissions that make the decisions about certification and other matters. Uh, and so that's kind of where we were at. But when the Senate came out, because qualified immunity and some other things were in their bill that were not on that list of things that we had come to, uh, uh, like a zone of possible agreement, we used to call it in my grad classes on negotiation, that ZOPA, uh, it was like stuff way outside of the ZOPA. <laughs> Not even like what was agreed, but out of what was even possible to agree. <laughs> and so that's when things started to fall apart. Not I think because the Senate proposed something different as much as I think that a lot of people, the House members, House leadership, much of the uh, Black and Latino caucus and the um, police unions were not expecting it. And it was that unexpected element that crashed in my view, the negotiation, just from a negotiation standpoint, right? And that just shows there wasn't enough trust in the beginning. So the trust we were building was new in many ways for many of the parties involved. Um, with regards to the models, uh, before I had this wonderful job, the best job I've ever had, I had other amazing jobs, <laughs> so I've been lucky. And, and one of them, I was doing some research on uh, racism as it intersects with health for American born black people. And I was doing that with a, a group, I was hired by a group called Chana17, C-H-N-A-1-7.org. Check their resources out on their website, great stuff on racism. And they do a lot of intersections around race and public health, race and healthcare. And so one of the things I did, cause I had some work in um, Somerville, Waltham and Cambridge, different levels of work. And I uh, was leading a research team and then also helping the Cambridge research team. And I saw some of the models that you referred to Somerville. Also, they have a social worker, uh, a team who's there not only to uh, have an alternative to arrest or a support in the event of an arrest when there's a need that is uh, mental health related, but they also uh, help to, to write the curriculum for the police training so that people are understanding uh, mental health and, and some race issues. Uh, and they look at race. This was a really important thing I found in terms of what has influenced me, not only in this bill, but the remember the driving bill, uh, the safe driving bill where we're not allowed to use cell phones anymore. And there was like that whole section in there around data collection. Uh, and I worked on that with some of these, like what, what happens if the data is bad? What kind of training do you need to do? Uh, what kind of anti-bias training? Well, I was influenced by a woman named um, Patty Contente, who is the head social worker or was at the time, uh, I think she still is at the Somerville Police Department because she told me a story that was very powerful. She said that um, 
their trainings on uh, um, racial bias were going pretty well. The police officers like them, which is a lot of times a problem. Like if the officers don't like the training, it doesn't work out in the same way. It doesn't have the same outcomes, which is true of all training of any kind. Uh, and a guy who had been part of developing the anti-bias part and delivering that training went away for a period of time. So that module was done differently and the officers hated it and the take up was bad. So she went and looked at what was different and they put that back in. And the main thing that was different is he didn't just talk about present bias. He talked about historical context. And he helped the officers understand that people that see you as racist are not actually seeing you individually as a person as racist. They're reacting to historical institutional experiences that they have personally had and that their family and friends have had repeatedly for hundreds of years. And they liken it to the experience of the white cops who are immigrants who can talk about the experience of their family members with discrimination historically and how it affected how they saw institutions until they were integrated into them as leadership. And you had uh, men and women saying things like, oh, I get that because, you know, it my Italian grandfather got spit on, you know, so, so it's helping people really couch in it. And um, there's a long way to go in Somerville, like everywhere else. But that incremental step forward and really getting it was really important. So in the work that I've done with the DOC, because uh, I work more with the Department of Correction than I do with police, but even in my visit with the state police, and we looked at their training, a bunch of legislators go and do that. The state police get thousands of hours more training than the typical police officer in, in, in a lot of issues, use of force. And so there's a lot of capacity there for them to learn good stuff. And so a lot of the best practices I've seen in places where people are putting all that time and money. And uh, that has really influenced my thinking about what's possible. But I do need to say, while I don't agree with people that say training doesn't work, I've been a trainer my whole life before becoming a state legislator. And uh, if there's anything I know, there's training that doesn't work is bad training. <laughs> So good training works and bad training doesn't work. But I also agree in a sense, because training is necessary, but far insufficient for dismantling structural racism. And one of the reasons for that is that there's no police officer on the planet that started structural racism. And so there's no amount of training all the police officers that are gonna turn policing into something that the rest of the world isn't yet. The rest of our country, our city, our legislature, our schools, you know, the Karens that are now, sorry for everybody named Karen, they've got that <laughs> temporarily ruined, you know, all that kind of stuff. The police officer training is not touching that. Or what I, what I raised in the beginning, our constitutional jurisprudence that absolutely legalizes brutality against Black people and disabled people, for example, against transgender people and not on purpose, not as a conspiracy, by habit a force of how our law has evolved from a plantation driven economy, where remember white men who didn't own land were not able to vote in the beginning. And uh, wrapping in impoverished white people against impoverished black people and immigrants has been a strategy politically and legislatively that's embedded in the laws we now have turning those groups against each other. So the training is, is necessary, but it's just the beginning. The cultural work needs to go in many other aspects of the law, uh, housing, education, et cetera, just like the plan that the Black and Latino Caucus has. And I'll say that uh, House and Senate leadership have both agreed that we're ready to start learning how to dismantle structural racism in housing and education in healthcare, et cetera. Thank you so much. Very comprehensive um, answer. Um, I've got two more that, panelists. That's a really nice way of saying long <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, 
Um, I think we'll go to Esther uh, Rogers um, for your two questions. Go ahead. Oh, we can't hear you, Esther. One second, one second. Okay, there we go. Hi. So, so um, this is more or less, you know, speaking to um, what you mentioned about the training. Um, when you're discussing education as a tool to root out police officers and police's biases, how do you counter the narrative of uh, it being, quote unquote, an attack on an indi on individual um, officer's character? That's such a good question. And it's really tied to your gifts and personality uh, because it is a lot of one-on-one -on -one and one-on group work. Uh, and it doesn't just happen around the policing bill. It, and we had to do it during the education bill where we were looking at fully funding uh, low-income districts for the first time. I had to talk about race with people quite a lot then. And then, like I said, with the driving bill. And I try to use, um, like I learned from Patty Contente's uh, uh, training module, I try to use things that the person I'm talking to can relate to. So for example, when I was trying to explain implicit bias, because people were laughing when I wanted to put that um, word, uh, first I was saying unconscious bias, you know, some people say that. And so I know they were behind my back because some people told me say, oh, if it's unconscious, what are you gonna do about it? You know, like, so the, people don't get what it is. So I, when, I, when I testified before the house, this is before COVID, so we're in the chamber, I got my girlfriend's red high heels and I brought them down with me to the podium, to the rostrum. And I put them up so people would be curious as I was speaking about the bill. This is the, the, the uh, data collection part of the, the driver's bill. And I said, I told them the story you may have heard when the Boston Symphony Orchestra had done all of this anti-racism work to try and make their hiring less biased than not biased and uh, with women and people of color. And they had gotten good outcomes uh, with people of color by having a curtain and doing other things to make auditions blind. But the women were still disproportionately not being selected. And thank God they knew that that meant they were doing something wrong and not that women are less talented musicians. <laughs> so they studied it and they realized that the women tended to wear heels. And when I told that part of the story, before I said it, I said, they realized, and I started making the shoes walk and asked them, what did they realize? That they could still tell about a person from behind a curtain. And it just dawned on a lot of people, like it dawned on them. And so then I explained the connection. I said, so when we're talking about biases, we're all dealing with this, even people that are working really, really hard on it. And it requires rigor, not just training, but all kinds of work. And so I did have a lot of people come up to me afterwards, pretty conservative people, and say, that's the first time I ever understood what that word meant, bias, in this context. Thank you. Uh, when we were doing um, the, the, the Student Opportunity Act, I went to the people that thought it was unfair that low-income districts should get more money than their districts. And I said, why do you think that? And they explained, and I said, oh, okay. Do you know that in my district, which is not poor, like I have a median district. I have, a, I'm one of the only people of color with a predominantly white district, okay? So in Boston, there's districts way poorer than mine. But in my district, two of my best schools, 20 to 30% of their kids are homeless at any given point of the year. I talked to four different groups. They were all men, because I took the hard cases, Republicans and conservative male Democrats on this issue, those were the tough cases. And in every group, their jaw dropped. And I had to work for my jaw not to drop that their jaw dropped because I'm so surrounded by that. I didn't know that they didn't know that homelessness is that pervasive, even in middle class to make a plane. And uh, they said, two of the guys in two different groups said to me, what do you mean homeless? So I had to explain them what it means. Like they sleep, but where do they sleep? Cars, shelters, family couches. And then I asked them, what do you think my kids need that your kids, because I looked up one of the guys, they had, I have a $60,000, $66,000 median income. He has a $125,000 median income and it's 150 where he lives. So I happen to know that. So I was like, did you know that? And he was like, yeah, he didn't know. I could, he's like, yeah. And I was like, 
So what do you think your kids, where you have maybe five poor kids out of a hundred, none of them homeless, or maybe one or two, need, don't need that my kids need? And they start listing stuff, stuff I didn't think of, like washer and dryer in the school. And you know, a lot of people were doing that work, not just me. Like going across the so-called aisles, depoliticizing anti-poverty measures, depoliticizing anti-racism measures and making it a human experience that people can relate to. Should I have to do that as a black woman, one of three at the time? No, but I'm okay with it. I ran knowing that, right? So I do it, they're receptive. I listen to their issues um, and they listen to mine. That's how humans work when we make it human instead of political. So those are some examples, concrete. Then, um, Representative Elogado, uh, we have one more final uh, panelist, um, Jarling Ho, who has some questions for you. Go ahead. Thank you, Representative uh, Nika um, Elgardo. Um, so my one of my questions actually was asked by Darren already, which was relating to building the trust uh, with the police unions after the Senate bill came out. Uh, so my second question relates to post. Um, and uh, I know uh, the individuals who are selected, the majority are not coming from law enforcement. Um, and that's, I think, the term that was used uh, in, in the bill. I'm curious about um, the negotiations that went on to determine the numbers uh, of individuals and how they would be selected. I'm also curious because I oh. wasn't in the room. <laughs> um, before I answer that, Darling, I, I should have said that Student Opportunity Act, that low income provision, unanimous, unanimously passed the House. Uh, so, so, so negotiation works when you pay attention to people and care about their point of view, uh, though they disagree with you. Um, so that particular negotiation around who's on the commissions and the committees, uh, and particularly the post uh, committees that relate to like setting those certification standards and then evaluating infractions and whatnot, um, that went on beyond the House bill getting passed into the conference committee work. The governor changed it when it came to his desk, and then it had to come back to us again for a vote uh, with changes that we had to make so that it would it would survive a veto uh, if he brought it, sent it back again. Um, so I think that uh, there was just a lot of back and forth between probably just the six people on the conference committee. And it was probably, it probably came down to those people uh, convincing each other at that point that there were enough members of law enforcement uh, and there were enough members of the community. The way that I heard it discussed afterwards, which my personal experience with negotiation is that was probably really different than what happened in the room. <laughs> um, but the way that it was publicly discussed is that some people who were not active duty law enforcement officers, but are law enforcement like the DA or somebody that the DA appoints should count as law enforcement. And if you count up the members that way, then it is a majority uh, law enforcement group. But some of those folks, depending on where in the state you are, are also considered to be strong advocates for uh, people making complaints against law enforcement. So that's what I heard externally. What, what they actually said to get it done, I may never know. <laughs> Thank you, thank you, Rep. Um, so I'm going to um, throw out um, some questions for um, our very um, intelligent audience. Um, and so um, I think behind the scenes, I have um, Rochelle who is compiling questions for me. Um, and um, um, okay. <laughs> All right, well, while I'm uh, waiting for your questions, do um, any of our panelists have um, any more questions? Any other questions? Uh, yes, uh, Darren. Sure, well, uh, Representative, um, I'm curious um, if, if you might, um, uh, you, you started off talking about the, the dismantling structural racism agenda. Um, 
uh, that uh, that you and, and others are are working towards. Um, you know, structural racism, like patriarchy, I mean, is is of course famous for its flexibility and its ability to continue to adapt and and persist uh, despite efforts. I, I'd be very curious about. Um, you know, would you would you tell a little bit uh, about maybe some of your other priorities in, in terms of dismantling structural racism? Uh, what are a few other things you're hoping to see uh, pass um, in in this sort of uh, you mentioned 20 bills and, and so on? Um, if and and particularly maybe if you want to pick you know one or two that are your, your you feel are, are most important uh, that that need to be dealt with right away in order to to, to take a to take a bite um, out of uh, out of structural racism in Massachusetts. Thank you. Sure. Uh, sure. Be, if you don't mind, instead of talking about individual bills, I'll talk about sort of um, areas of bills <laughs> uh, because there's a, they, yeah. Anyway, um, systemically it's hard to say one bill will do it. But uh, with regards to the 15 to 20, that's looking within the criminal justice system. And then there are dozens, if not hundreds in housing and uh, healthcare, transit, equity, like the governor vetoed most of the transit equity provisions that were in the transportation um, bond bill that we got passed in the echo death bill, you know, that would uh, make <laughs> transportation fair and, and accessible and, and, um, and affordable for more people. Uh, but um, within the criminal justice arena, uh, my main focus is that there are too many people in prison. Well, I don't believe in prison, but put that aside. Based on our current construction of what prison is, there are too many people in there. There are people there that would serve us better in our communities. Hundreds and hundreds of them. I know them, I work with them. Uh, when it's not COVID, I go there monthly. And before my accident, I was going there less than monthly but you know, in safe circumstances, still able to meet with them occasionally. Uh, and the undersecretary of uh, public safety has been a huge ally for me on this. And so has Commissioner Michi. And so the key there is what are incarcerated activists saying that needs to change? And what they are telling me needs to change among other things is this life without parole. And I would add mandatory, getting rid of all mandatory minimum sentencing. There should be no thing that you do that your case facts don't matter as to whether or not you're gonna be in prison for the rest of your life when you're 19 years old. Uh, so that should just never happen. And there are a lot of people who came in at 1920. So we've done some work on juvenile justice. So the folks that came in on 1718 have some opportunities to appeal and get out. But that brain doesn't stop developing until 26. And some people change a lot between 26 and 50 even. <laughs> Most people do, especially people that all they have is time. That's what the guy inside of the walls tell me. They have developed some of the most sophisticated, and I've done board development with literally dozens of organizations and organizational development with literally hundreds. And I have never seen a board that operates better than um, the African-American Coalition Committee, which is made exclusively of incarcerated men. And they draft legislation, they do all kinds of stuff. And then there's these uh, lifers groups these people have done more personal leadership development of themselves and each other in the last year before COVID than most people do in their whole lives. And it shows. Uh, Russell Holmes introduced me to them and I've been a big fan ever since. And then uh, he, we introduced uh, Congresswoman Presley and she brought members of the Black Caucus from, in, from DC and they blow everybody's mind. So the key is let them drive the conversation about what needs to be done. And that's where I get life without parole and um, uh, mandatory minimums. And there's a, there's a whole agenda actually that they have. And you can visit them when COVID's over. You can come with us and, and we can, you can see for yourself. Uh, but then outside of that, um, I work, I just started working with the correctional officers as well because uh, some of you may know that at SUSA, there's all kinds of horrible stuff going on. 
And it breaks my heart that we don't include correctional officers in our thinking because that toxic environment is what they are working in every day, as well as people providing food, providing medical services and cleaning services. So incarcerated facilities are communities. And uh, we need the voice of all the members of their communities, including family members of the people that live and work there uh, to really have a, a fully comprehensive plan for dismantling structural racism. So we've got three structural racism commissions focusing on DOC, reentry, and uh, parole that came out of this bill, plus a permanent commission on the status of black men more broadly than DOC. Uh, and then we've also got for some other people groups, uh, Latinos and or Latinx and um, Asian Americans also. So beginning to understand and to agree that structural racism is, is embedded in the policies is important. And so we'll have to follow up with bills like that. And then in housing, uh, a big mission of mine is to uh, reframe our thinking about public and affordable housing away from a charity model into an investor model. So when uh, I like to tour when it's not COVID, I like to sit in the tour in my public housing developments, I like to sit in the courtyards, be accessible, go to the tennis court, be accessible, um, the basketball court. And uh, in the beginning, these old ladies would come up to me in their 80s. This means they have great grandchildren, okay? Some great greats. And that means they have been in this public housing development for four or five generations. And they're trying to ask me at first, they don't do this anymore. Rep Mika, please go there and you tell them not to let me lose my housing. And I was like, don't you ever ask me that again. I'm very respectful, especially to elders. So the first time I said that to an 80 something year old black woman, she looked at me like I was crazy. And I said, the reason you can't ask me is because what you need to be saying is, Nika, I want, I have invested in this community, my money, my time, my children, my children's children and their children, my culture, my energy for 50 plus years, I expect a return on my investment. What's it gonna be? I will not be begging on your behalf. I will be informing them <laughs> that with regards to public goods like public housing, you are a primary investor and we expect to see some return on investment models. And so I have a bill related to the very first step in that, which is uh, expanding public housing and getting more of the state's resources in terms of land to, devoted to that. And then I'm working on some tenant protection stuff and some other things in housing, uh, both that I filed and co-filed and also that I'm supporting home rule petitions and locally uh, to get affordable housing dollars, land, uh, supply, and tenant protections. Those are the four stools uh, or four uh, legs of the stool that I'm uh, preaching about there on Beacon Hill. And it's all about uh, taking out our conception that being poor is something that people do versus something that society does to them through our laws and regulations. Thank you, Representative. Um, I've got three uh, questions on my queue. Uh, one uh, from Bianca Ortiz uh, Wright, I think her name is. Yeah. Uh, hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yes. Uh, awesome. Um, first, thanks to Rep uh, Lugardo. Um, this has been a really rich discussion. Um, I've learned a lot. Um, I guess my question is re in regards to police and schools. Um, I have a lot of friends who are justice or um, education justice organizers who are working on campaigns um, against a school push out, school to prison pipeline. Um, and I think in all of this discussion about police brutality, um, I guess I'm always baffled that the same outrage isn't extended to our youth um, who many are, um, you know, deal with police brutality in their schools, who are dealing with surveillance. Um, and so I'm wondering, does the police reform bill hold school resource officers accountable as well? Um, and what your opinions are, if you have any on police in schools? Yeah, so I, I, my personal opinion is no police in schools, uh, including universities folks. And that mm -hmm. last one was a hard one for me to come to because uh, my student activism work at MIT involved partnerships with the police around suicide and things like that. Uh, but I have been convinced that a lot of the good work done by campus police officers 
uh, can, uh, can actually be done by professionals in those areas. <laughs> um, and those uh, campus police officers should be employed, you know, with a local department so that we still have those resources available for, you know, somebody running around with a gun or different things that only the police can handle. Um, but certainly K to 12, zero police ever on the premises, unless there's a crime that's been committed and they're coming to, you know, deal with it. Um, to make that a reality, we have to make a lot of changes to the supports that we provide. First of all, fully funding low income school districts for the first time in, in uh, Massachusetts history. So that's a good start. And it looks like we're gonna be able to get started on actually implementing that this year, which we weren't able to last year because of COVID, but I was grateful that we decided to hold uh, and not to do any cuts despite all the money we lost. Um, I did work on some amendments. I don't, they were not in the policing bill. Uh, they were in, I think, I think it was our echo dev bill. We had five bills that were running into conference committee all uh, throughout the summer. And I think in the echo development bill, we got some um, more restrictions on SROs. What I really focused on is that the police database, that, that getting rid of the gang database and prohibiting its use in schools. And that's like sort of like a, a, a first step uh, or a next step. Um, and uh, that got done, but there were some little loopholes left there where uh, verbal things can be done, or I mean, oral things can be done as long as they're not written down and uh, things can be said about people's family members. So we got some loopholes that we need to get rid of, uh, but I just, the gang database is bad for youth in general, but it's especially destructive when it's being used in what should be a safe space for all youth, all youth regardless of what they're involved in, uh, which is the schools. Uh, so there, there are activists working on that, um, and there are other legislators that do more on that than I do, and I support their work uh, wholeheartedly. But the progressive movement, I think, in general, is is, a, is pretty much unanimous around uh, moving police out of K to twelve. Thank you, Rep. Uh, Anthony Morse. Hello, Representative. Uh, hope you're having a good, great day. Um, the question I have kind of related to something you said. So I, I live in I live in Easton, and I grew up in I grew up in a small town in Massachusetts. And when you think about that, every community has a police department, and then on top of that, you have the campus police departments, and then you have crossover police departments with M MBTA. Is how do you convince? First of all, with the mission of police, like why are they doing stuff like ticketing on the highway when that's really code enforcement, right? Like they're doing all this code enforcement work when do you really need two guys with guns to show up or can you just have someone go give a ticket and say, Hey, you, you can't do this. So the question becomes like one, how do you reduce the footprint of 351 departments and convince towns? Like these officers aren't really doing public safety work. They're doing, you know, they're doing the periphery, either code enforcement or, um, you know, social work. Um, and then I guess off of that is, is there a legitimate, reason to keep a police force around you know it's a debate my wife and i have and i said the only thing i can think of is kind of keeping organized crime in check so you don't have you know someone come in and say i own this town now and i you know so i guess yes yeah. so those are my questions and thank you thank for your you. hard work thank you anthony there are activists that make um strong and compelling arguments for abolishing the police um i am not one of those <laughs> And uh, they don't tend to be activists that are primarily active in primarily black and brown communities. Um, and I think that's because you can envision a life where nobody's coming to uh, help you with a domestic violence disturbance if you've never experienced domestic violence, or I, I don't know. It's kind of confusing to me because a lot of the stuff that gets unpoliced in suburban communities is bad. Like suburban communities have drugs and domestic violence and all that type of stuff, but it seems like it's not policed. And so they have a safer relationship with the police, but uh, equally bad relationship with suicide and drugs and, 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 and violence in the homes. So maybe the police aren't an effective place to deal with that. But I do know that um, here, uh, in Boston, a lot of especially 40s and up P 
people of color say, we don't want the police that are beating us up. We want the police that are helping us out. And uh, that's where posts and that type of stuff where you're decertifying the ones and you're getting rid of the ones that are getting a lot of complaints in the community and they have the ability to do that. I personally think, I haven't figured out what the answer is um, in terms of the police department. I think because the problem with policing isn't just the police department, it's the criminalization of poverty and the um, the spread of poverty through other other aspects of our legislation. So if everybody, if so, when youth have jobs, this is a data data checked. When youth have jobs, they don't commit crime. And if they have good jobs, they're especially good. <laughs> so if they have jobs that are fun and have a future, uh, you know, that are going to lead them to better jobs, those youth don't commit crime. And so is it all on changing the police departments when we're just constantly perpetuating criminal behaviors? Uh, no, I think if people have fair housing, adequate housing, healthy housing, if people have jobs and fair wages, uh, then we don't have to worry as much about transforming the police department um, as we do as we do now, because they have so much to deal with. But you know, I need the police to come when I hear gunshots down the street as we did uh, a few days ago uh, on my street. Um, I need the police to come when a man is um, holding up his ex-girlfriend with a gun. Uh, I need the police to come, this is more controversial, uh, but sometimes you get calls, people say social workers should address them because they're mental health calls. But, uh, you know, I was watching a case of a mental health call. This was a white family, so there were no race issues but um, the police came and somebody thought they should have brought a social worker, but they didn't. And the girl uh, who was having the struggle, the mental health struggle, came out surprisingly with a knife and attacked three police officers and killed or injured one. And she ended up getting killed. Uh, and uh, as they were trying to save the second one that she was, um, she put one down the other one she attacked and, and, and they, the third one was trying to save him when she was killed. If a social worker had gone to that call instead of a police officer, that person would almost certainly be dead. So I think it's complicated and I don't know the answer. That's my final answer. <laughs> Thanks, Rip. And we have a final question. Esther Rogers has been patiently uh, raising her hands. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Rob. So I'm glad that this is a good segue because my question is about the mental health um, aspect. Now, we all know that, you know, Massachusetts is, is woefully um, have a lack of resources for mental health substance abuse. And I'm just wondering, you know, with this whole thing with defunding, you know, the police is not really defunding the police. It's really, we are allocating resources you know, for mental health and substance abuse issues. How do you um, actually reconcile that knowing that the services are not actually um, really fully there to take on, you know, additional responsibilities from the population? Yeah, I think that's a great point. And it's uh, maybe more directly saying what I was rambling, rumbling around <laughs> uh, in the answer to my last question which is we need um, especially low-income communities to have uh, meaningful access to healthcare, including behavioral health and substance use disorder counseling. Uh, and we need it in schools, we need it in communities. Uh, there are bias and, and cultural uh, barriers. Uh, even in that research I mentioned, we were not just looking at police, we were looking at other providers and we were uh, interviewing um, patients as well. And uh, people come with their own cultural barriers, especially when they're in a cross-cultural or third culture situation here in the United States. Uh, but African-Americans too, born here, uh, we have issues with healthcare. We see that with the vaccination. Today I got 20 slots open uh, with this horrible uh, bonkers rollout of the vaccine that Governor Baker's running, <laughs> which means that today, like around 11, someone's like, if you tell me by five, I can get 20 of your people vaccinated if you give me all this information about them now. 
Mm -hmm. And like, okay, because you couldn't have told me that like two months ago when we found out the vaccines were coming. Um, and, you know, a lot of the elders in one of my neighborhoods said no, right? Because of the biases that they have and the experiences that they've had with healthcare and because of historical things that have happened like Tuskegee uh, uh, situation and whatnot. And so if we don't fully fund uh, adequate health care for everyone, uh, there's not, the police department can't take that on. It can't live in the police department. <laughs> and it can't even just live in the health care system. It has to be inside of our public housing facilities and inside of our schools and the places where people are so that we can break down the stereotypes too and the other transportation and work time access issues. So I would just say that uh, uh, this is a great ending question because it lands on the systemic nature of structural racism, but also the systemic nature of justice, not just in the negative, but also in the positive. We cannot talk about housing justice without talking about healthcare uh, justice. Uh, we can't on education. We can't talk about immigration uh, without talking about labor justice. And so uh, climate, you know, touches on all of those things in a very integral way. So we have to get more sophisticated about mapping out systems and talking in, about our budget in a systemic way. Uh, and my, I'll put out a quick plug for outcomes-based budgeting. And that's very tricky because you can do that badly. Like you can do that in a way that doesn't actually tie to real changing communities. But if you have no sense of the results of your budget, then it just becomes about each legislator getting brownie points. Yeah, I brought uh, $1.25 million uh, into my district as a first year, hoo hoo, for uh, not not even total, just for youth jobs and public housing, for PPE and testing and whatnot. And so what if at the if when I leave there's nothing there, right? So we need to hold ourselves and our legislators accountable to things that that outlive their terms, and we need to give people a chance to demonstrate. Uh, their four, five, six, eight, ten-year plans and how they're getting there instead of just uh, picking up these slogans that are constituents-like and feeling like we're doing a good enough job because we stand behind the legislation that matches the slogan. And I hope our conversation today has started to unpack that a little bit of how it would look in one area. Wow. Uh, Representative Nika Elugado, everyone, please let's give her a round of applause. We need to hear you <laughs> and see you. Uh, absolutely. Thank you so much, Representative um, Elugado. What a fascinating, 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 informative, brilliant conversation. Um, thank you so much for um, spending your hour and a half. We could go on. I mean, this is uh, fascinating, a wealth of information. I'm so proud of you as our representative. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, thank you to our panelists, uh, um, uh, the, Dean Cash, um, Darren Q, um, Esther Rogers, and Jarling Ho. Thank you to you, um, the audience, all uh, 55 of you, I think. Um, I see you out there. Thank you for joining us. Um, if you were like me, this was enthralling, uh, really, really, really um, informative. I feel empowered. <laughs> I feel sort of ready, inspired to go, um, really, uh, you know, sort of... Um, you know, empowered with, you know, a lot of wealth of information um, through this conversation. Thank you again, uh, Representative Ologadu. It's been a great pleasure. I put both my email and my aide, his name is Frank Mendoza. Um, I put our emails there. Uh, Frank handles scheduling. So for those of you who privately or otherwise posted that you'd like to connect, it might take some weeks or a couple months, just depending on the subject matter and what we got to get through first and my health. Uh, but we will sit down if you want to do that. So let me know. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. <laughs>